All right. With that, we've got Nima from Shippo interviewing Dan with the previous question from Muesli. This is a really interesting uh, uh, brand, and you're going to hear some of the unique challenges that what the Dan would you say the fastest growing prescription uh, e-commerce brand in, in the U.S. in the world? Like could be, to, yeah, to hard to say. Could be something like that, right? So feels like it to me. <laughs> yeah, and literally right before Dan came on camera, he's 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 folding boxes. And when we were having our content planning session, um, you know, creating packages. I mean, look, we're, yeah, I mean, we're in the office. This is you know, yeah. live inventory. We're moving. Yeah, that's so awesome. All right, with that, I will let you two take it away. Thank you so much, Derek. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, beyond beyond excited uh, to be here. Tremendously grateful to everyone at Pipe 17 for putting this on. My dear friend, Ryan, Derek, thank you for all your patience, Mo, John, the entire crew. And of course, Dan, thank you for making time. Um, we're very lucky to have you here. Um, in our business, uh, we're, we're fortunate to serve as parcel infrastructure for many different kinds of businesses. And, you know, in the 10 years we've been in business, I can, I can tell you this, y'all are one of the fastest growing, um, <laughs> you are, um, the data doesn't lie. Right. And, and, uh, you know, I think you specifically, Dan, you're sort of a prototype of an operator's favorite operator. You know, you're a founder sure. and CEO previously yourself, right. um, you're at Muesli now, uh, in a vice president role overseeing operations. So. I'd love to just start first with a brief introduction about yourself. Sure. Um, and then and then we can get into it. And we that. can go. Yeah. So um, I'm a pharmacist by trade. I used to own my own pharmacy. I actually got into Muesli via fulfillment. I started doing fulfillment for them and then switched over. And now I'm over the, the pharmacy and development space for them. So we have two pharmacies, one that's here in Salt Lake City. We have another one um, in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, we sense it is it's all dermatology and it's all compounded. So that means everything that goes out the door has to be made by us first. We don't just put it together and send it. We actually have to physically weigh the powder, make the cream, pump it into the bottle, right? All the pieces, right? Fold the boxes, put it all together. So there's a lot of pieces uh, here. Um, I think currently we have about 10 million pieces of inventory on top of. Uh, you know, because every bo everything has its piece. So you have the 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 bottle, the the pump top, the cap, the inner box, the outer box, the flyer, the like all the different pieces, right? And uh, because it's pharmacy, we have just a myriad of regulations on top of it. So um, every single prescription ha you have to be seen by a doctor first, and then the doctor has to approve you for a prescription. Then the prescription comes into the system has to be entered in patient specific to the system, match it to the product, has to be checked by a pharmacist and then goes out to shipping. So there's logistically, there's just all these pieces going on at the same time and all these systems that kind of have to work together um, as far as the logistics of having all the pieces, having what's work in progress, what's finished goods, um, you know, running out of labels, running out of boxes, like all these things are all moving all the time. So it becomes operationally becomes challenging. And then all of a sudden you start to grow and the three months of inventory you had becomes three weeks of inventory and the boat from China, like can't get here fast enough. And yeah, there have been those days where like pull it off the truck. Cause we got to get it out the door. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, nuanced, uh, introduction. I think anyone who's uh, been fortunate, and I say fortunate because it really is, uh, may we all have growth problems. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, fortunate to be in your position. There's a tremendous amount of uh, learnings and and uh, scars that come from it. Uh, my sister famously says, "What doesn't kill you leaves permanent scars." So, amen. <laughs> I want to I want to specifically double down on the scars because at the end of the day that's where the lessons come from and that's For how sure. we really get to enjoy our successes knowing how painful the pains were. Right. So Dan I'm curious, you know, what's been the biggest challenge especially in the last let's just call it uh, 12 months sure. as we're coming out of sort of the the covid phase the covid era. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like we're back to if you will 
the new, the, the new normal. normal. Right. Sure. Sure. Like what's yeah, been I mean, the biggest struggle? The biggest challenge for us is, is something that we didn't really realize until it happened was supply chain. Uh, in traditional pharmacy and even in compounding pharmacy, there's a broker who's a wholesaler and that wholesaler, he, they sell you your product, whether it's the chemicals or the bases or the whatever goes into your product, right? And that's usually like a one day to a two day turnaround. And so if you're ever out, out of something, you're two days away from being back in stock. Um, the issue is when we started to grow, I mean, we now have 800,000 patients so as we started to grow, where traditional compounding pharmacies buy in grams or milligrams, we're buying in kilos, hundreds of kilos at a time. And so there was a time where we launched a new product and we bought up the entire U.S. supply chain. And so we couldn't get it. And um, the issue in our world with all the regulations is we couldn't go outside the U.S. to buy it because you have to be an FDA registered importer. So it was literally just, you have to wait. And so we went a few weeks waiting, telling our patients we're sorry, backing up thousands of orders, right? And, and these were capsules, which are different than creams. They're a little bit harder to make. So then we come out of this break and you're hundreds of thousands of capsules down. And it is like a mountain of, the, of just anxiety all the time, all the time, all the time. And, and so, you know, the learnings from that are like, when you launch a new product, you have to be prepared one for potential failure, but also for success, right? Because if success hits you, it can hit you hard. So now when we have new products come out, we actually have um, a supply chain coordinator who says, great, you can get us the supply, but can you get us the supply for six months? Can you get us the supply for a year? And so, there are times where we've had to go to our supplier and they don't tell you where it's sourced from because that's their secret, but they, they, but they say, okay, we can bring it in, but you have to make this, what they call the blanket order. So you have to say, we're going to buy this much for this long. And so our last blanket order was over a million dollars for a chemical that we had to supply for the next, what, three to six months. And that's a, I mean, it's a great, problem to have but it's it's a problem nonetheless right if you don't if you don't plan for it it becomes a big big problem well speaking about that how do you how do you balance uh the cash flow needs of the business i mean if you're going from hey before we were planning on buying x amount of inventory sure. and now we're planning on buying 3x the inventory uh what are things you all have done to get creative about sort of managing your cash flows in this environment? Yeah, I mean, luckily for us, we've always been what we call a net zero company. So all of our money that we that we make, we put re reinvest back into the company, whether that's through marketing or through whatever. So it's never been like, you can't do that, we don't have money. It's always been, okay, let's plan. And, and, and it's just that communication between the pharmacy and the finance team and the executive team to say, hey, like we're having success, but success also costs money. Right. And it costs money in people and it costs money in space and it costs money, right? And all the things. Like, for example, um, we're moving out of our current space into a space that's three times larger. And so, great. That's fantastic. But then there's this logistical nightmare of moving because every single, we, as a pharmacy, you're licensed in every state individually. So now I have to work with every single state government in the country to get us transferred into our new space, which, which, so for us to move, we can't just move our stuff. It's going to take us six months to a year to move just because all those licenses don't, don't fall over. Right. And so there's all these, all these long run projects for us, right? There's the immediate fire of, Hey, we just had our Memorial day sale. It was the biggest day in company history, all hands on deck. we got to fill all the orders. And then there's the Holy cow, like, if we don't order more stuff in four months, we're going to be out of stuff, right? So for us and for me in particular, most of my stuff is long run planning because I'm saying, hey, today's fine, but in six months, in a year, like if our business doubles, it's not going to work anymore. That's actually, I think, a, a fabulous place to be, meaning if you're within an organization where you really are focused on longer term planning versus necessarily, hey, like what's happening this quarter, what's happening next quarter. I do personally, 
it, it brings its own challenges, but from an operator standpoint, um, I think there's there's a certain amount of freedom that comes with that sort of longer time horizon to really see beyond you know your own nose. I mean, I can say For this sure. having us having been in business ten years, part of our maturation and evolution that will you know forever go on has been the longer planning cycles. Really getting out of you know when when you're a you know less than twelve month old company, right? You're 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 in knife fights. Oh, to, every day, yeah. To earn the right to live tomorrow, yep. let alone one month or or a quarter out, and yeah, it's a privilege to be in a place where you can really look past your own nose and say, "Hey, we've we've developed a point of view on our business. This right. is how we're going to grow for the long term, and we're right. going to plan for it that way." Right. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, and it's not a, it's not just a oh to go to two x we we two x this, right? Yeah. Like you can't right. go from you know, we are now filling over a million prescriptions a year. When we started, it was a couple hundred. And, and those are different worlds because th just the challenges are different. I mean, you're a shipping guy. Shipping becomes a big deal, right? A and it used to be, hey, USPS used to come almost every day. Or actually, when we very, very first started, I had to load the bags into the back of my truck and take them to the post office in the back of my car. Been there. Yeah. <laughs> And, and we're now to the point where we have pallets, Gaylords, right? And we're filling five, six, ten of them a day, and we have a box truck come pick them up. But I mean, there are days where, like, if they don't show up, we don't have space to put things anywhere, mm -hmm. right? Like, just these these great challenges that they're they're still problems, but they're funner problems to solve than than knife fighting to till yeah. tomorrow, right? Yeah, for sure. You know, I think one of the one of the things uh, Jordan from Pit Viper just she was sharing was, as your operations grow, some of that complexity grows. And I think, not I think, I mean like, and and I, and your experience, my experience, uh, seemingly Jordan's experience, as you as your business grows, some of that complexity doesn't uh, just multiply, but it actually compounds. Right. Especially when it comes to supply chain, like you know, you're talking about. Uh, uh, you know, 10 million pieces of inventory and 800,000 patients. Right. Like uh, um, anything that could go wrong previously, now the standard deviation of what can go wrong is higher. There's multiple For factors sure. to play. So yeah. how do you think about, because again, you know, there's like we operate on the technology side of, of supply right. chain, but, you know, I don't, I don't, let hubris get to me like i i understand that supply chain a large piece of it is is where you're sitting right it's, it's the physical piece so sure. as as a leader in the company how do you think about uh staying ahead of sort of industry trends and tech advancements to, right. to make sure that your operations like you remain competitive and on the cutting right. edge I mean, so, so, so for, for us, let's break that into two pieces, right? Number one, there's the actual physical product that we have, which is medication. And um, we are not a manufacturer. We are not finding semaglutide or the next great weight loss med to, to ship out to market. We use drugs that are already been, um, they've already been passed through the FDA process, right? All those things. So for us, that's the one thing is that we're, we're doing, as we think about that proactively, we're recombining kind of old things to make new things, right? And using them in ways that are usually already accepted, but haven't really been commercialized or haven't really been brought to light. It's, hey, in the general practice, dermatologists use this chemical to do this thing, but that's not what it's approved for. But if we make something since we're a compounder, we don't have to go through the FDA process. We can say we're making this for this thing and then we can roll through it. Um, but that brings in its own supply chain issues. Like we have a, we have a, a cream that's a facial hair removal cream, right? And the idea behind it or the purpose behind it is it, is it slows down the growth of hair follicles. So if you're a female and you don't want you know you have hairs that pop up and you don't want them to grow anymore if you're a male that you don't want hair to grow in a place then you, you put it on it slows it down well the company that made the commercial product um shut it down went out of business right and, and because they weren't selling enough and and that's a whole other thing 
but then it made supply chain for us really hard because now we're the only person in the market buying it. And so then we had to go out and say, okay, we need to find more than one source, right? Yes, you can source it, but can you source it and make sure that you're not sourcing it from the same person um, and, and, and make sure that we're planning ahead. And lo and behold, all these people that used to use the, the manufactured product are now coming to us because they want that solution, right? And so for us, it's, it's kind of adapting to these market changes and, and understanding what's, what's new or what's really what's old, but still new in, in the world of dermatology, what the problems are, and then having the technology to, to support the scale, right? The, the one thing, um, you know, you're wearing your Shippo jacket. The one thing Shippo does for us is like sh the, the unfortunate truth about my world is shipping is the slowest part. That's just what it is. And it's made that way. And we cannot, we really can't just make it faster, right? Because we have to match the person's prescription with their, with their box and their label. And so all these pieces have to come together and we can optimize it, but we can only optimize it so much. I mean, you get to a point where, Hey, we're only gaining two or three seconds at a time. And yes, those add up over days and months, but it's only so much, right? So the other thing, and I'm sure, you know, Jordan talked about that as well, is like, you can only optimize what you could optimize. And there's, you get to these diminishing returns where, hey, we're not going to get any better. And if we get any better, we're not going to, we're not going to gain anything. I love what you just said. Like the marginal, the marginal cost and, and performance that you can mm -hmm. eat out of shipping will right. never go to zero because right. it's a physical gain. Right. There's, there's, there's trucks and sort centers and planes yep. and. The marginal cost and speed is never going to go to zero. I don't care how much automation right. you add. Right. Um, and and I think as 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 leaders and as operators, it's important for us to communicate that internally, but also externally to our customers that hey, for sure, like managing those expectations are tremendously important. And and um, yeah, I love and yeah. That. And, and yes, the big the hurricane or the power outage, the tornado affects shipping in real life. Like, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Right, sure. We don't have Amazon fulfillment centers in every state in America. I'm sorry. And it turns out even Amazon. Even uh, Amazon. They can't, they can't prevent hurricanes. Weird. <laughs> You'd think by now, right? Um, you know, thinking about some of the uh, most successful strategies and initiatives you guys have implemented. Yeah. Um, to improve operational efficiency and ultimately customer satisfaction, which right. leads to monies. Right. How how do you measure success of your strategies as a, as an executive team? And like, what are the key metrics that you actually follow? Well, there's two different companies, right? So there's yeah. there's the parent company that's the actual seller. Like you go through, you get the prescription, the process, and then there's the pharmacy company, and that's the fulfillment end. And they, they measure differently. And so you have to silo those. I'm a bridge between the two because I am employed by the corporate, but I oversee the, the pharmacy space, right? And so where it, where it kind of comes to a head is where the rubber hits the road. That's money, right? And so we have to get really granular, but then also really simplified and say, okay, rather than saying like, how efficient is every person in every process? We say, okay, if we group it all together, we say we, we shipped X number of units over a month and this was our payroll cost. So we are X cost, per, like in the simplest terms, we're X cost per unit, right? And, and we manage that number and then we, we can flex those things up and down. And, and the interesting thing on the pharmacy side is everyone like pharmacists have their own license, which take, is a, a doctorate degree, takes you know seven years to get there. Then there's pharmacy technicians, which is a licensed profession. And then there are, are shippers, which can be in person. And so certain people can only do certain tasks, right? And so then you have to flex your workspace. Like, hey, if we have plenty of inventory that's already made, but we don't have, uh, but we have, you know, 3,000 shipments that need to go out the door, like we might flex some of the technician workload into the shipping workload, right? Mm -hmm. And vice versa to make sure you always want to try and operate because as you get more more and higher licensing, you're paying people more and more money. So you don't want the $50, $60 an hour person doing the $15 an hour job if you can avoid it. Yes. But 
I've spent, be tons. but I've spent my fair share of shipping packages, right? I mean, and folding boxes and driving things back and forth, right? It's, I, you know, in the end, and in, in a startup, like when you're the guy, you're the guy, yes. and it kind of doesn't matter. The job's the job, and get the job done, and get over yourself. Whether that's, you know, shipping boxes or cleaning toilets, it just has to happen. Yep. So is is the is the North Star metric then for you, sort of the is it is it revenue divided by like units how, yeah like is i that mean that that's a it? i would say that's a guidepost that's okay. not a north star that's a guidepost okay. right there's there's a lot of pieces that go into that um you've got to look at you've got to look at inventory on hand right mm -hmm. the other thing is there's these legalities around what we do that as we make inventory it's not good forever Our, it actually has a six month expiration date and two of those months are going to be used with the patient using it. So if we don't get that product like on the shelf and out the door in basically under two months, it's going to go bad and we throw it away. So we have to look at like inventory use. What, what's our stock on hand? What are we making? How's it being made? Um, you know, what's our chemical supply? All these pieces. And then also like how many shipments are going out the door? How long are they taking? Are we, do we have outliers? whatever, right? On top of returns, on top of all the things. So it's mostly us. We try to stay within a like 24 to 48 hour turn um, for most of our stuff. We're only open five days a week though. So um, when we come in on Monday, we get prescriptions every single day. So we get all Saturday, all Sunday and all Monday, they add up. And then you have like, I mean, you, you think you have a case of the Mondays, you get a three X punch in the face every time you walk into work. Um, yeah, I think I think this week we were we were like ten thousand units that had to go out, like because our we're three thousand plus every day, and now all of a sudden you walk in like okay, and so Mondays usually bleed into Tuesdays and, and whatnot, and then you're you're always chasing your tail. But the North Star me metric is is flow, right? Mm -hmm. That's really the word that I like to use. Mm -hmm. is flow. Are things continuing to move? Yes, there's going to be an outlier. There's going to be a this that we missed or a that that came back or a whatever. But are things always moving? Right. Like in our world, it has to go so fast. Our inventory has to turn so fast. I mean, we measure our we could we could probably measure our finished goods inventory in hours if we wanted to instead of days. Wow. Because it's wow. just it's going that fast. Right. Wow. But for us, it, it we don't worry about all we could get into the nitty gritty. We don't worry about the little things. Is is everything moving? Right. right. And we have we have a lot of visual reminders. Yeah. Like you can see right here, these are buckets of inventory. They hold about yeah. 75 units a piece. So you can look on a shelf and say, okay, how much do we have? Got it. Right. I can see that. You can look when those are checked, you can say, okay, how many do we have to get shipped? I can see that. And then our shipping, we, we keep track every hour of like, this is how much we started with and how much we got out. So we can kind of see our efficiency as the day goes on of like, how much are we getting? Right. And then, and, and then we see over time, like, Hey, a normal, good shipping hour is going to be, you know, 50 to 60 a person. Uh, you're going to have these weird hours where we couldn't find this or something happened or whatever. And you're, you're down, but like there, we got to, we have to keep everyone moving. Otherwise you get caught up in, right. It's, it's super easy to get caught up in the little thing. I can't yeah. find this or I can't do that. Like, great. Put the one thing aside and get the 50 other things done and we'll solve the one later. Yes. 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 Uh, how, how much, I mean, look like, Inventory sitting on shelves is a problem for everyone. I don't sure. care if it's selling jeans yeah. or candles or medicine, but medicine is very different because sure. there's actually a shelf life. Right. So it is more urgent for you. How, uh, like on the stack of things uh, uh, that you're that you mitigate risk on, how mm -hmm. much of a risk factor is that for your business, and how much time do you spend? How much time do you spend I, thinking about that? I, I would actually say little. So there's. It, it's a very weird dynamic. There's different pieces. So there's what we call API, which is active pharmaceutical ingredient. That's the powder, right? That you put into the cream. Now, when we get API, it's valid for usually like as it is stored at room temperature, two to three years. So when we get it, like it's essentially for us infinite base kind of the same way. But when you combine them, now you're going down to 180 days, right? So all of a sudden when I put it together, we get the rules in. And so we use our, our data to say, okay, what are we going to make and how much are we going to make? Our average batch is about 600 units at a time. So it's pretty small batches considering that we're sending out, you know, 
60 to 70,000 units a month. Uh, and so we're always going. So I ha we don't really get in. The only time that we're really throwing inventory away or, or having to discard inventory is if we do formulary change. So if we say, hey, this drug, we're going to quit making and we're going to start making this, we'll usually phase that down, but we're, we're never throwing out, you know, thousands and thousands of bottles of stuff. Well, thank goodness for that, for you. Right. <laughs> it, it makes us, it, I mean, it makes us super, super efficient and we yeah. have to be, but like, you know, the, the, that's one of the good things about being at scale is the waste for us goes, goes down dramatically just because everything you make, you're like, Hey, best of term, this is going to be on the shelf for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Right. Everything else is going to be days. Um, I guess as a, as an OG e-com operator now, um, what, what advice do you have for the rest of us? Like if there was one key lesson, uh, that you could leave the group with good or bad. I mean, you, you got to go through the sucky part, right? I mean, that's what it is. I've been the through the, say, you got to go I've, through the sucky. <laughs> yeah, I've I've been through the hard part on a lot of companies, and you and you have to be. I I think going through the hard part is actually not hard when you start because mm -hmm. you expect it, right? Mm -hmm. The hardest part when you become efficient and you start to grow and become a, a, a an actual you know, entity with employees and all the things, the hardest part is giving up tasks. Mm -hmm. The hardest part is saying, okay, we're so big here that we're going to start another one there. And I know that if I'm here, this is going to operate at level 100 because I'm going to be there. Yeah. But when I have one there, it can't be at 100 because I'm not there. Right. And so you have to like console yourself with the fact that, you know, 100 plus 80 is 180. It's yeah. bigger than the 100 that you have. And, and, you know, the, that's the expansion issue is like, you're never going to find a person that's as passionate as a founder because yeah. they're just not right. And, and I'm not the founder of this, but I'm passionate about the business that it is. And I built it. So I'm very passionate about it. And so like, that's why I'm here when I'm not supposed to be here, like helping things go because I knew we had a big sale and I knew that we got behind. Uh, but like, you have to let go of things and, and let people do them in their own way right which as long as it gets the job done their way's okay i think a lot of times an operator will say well you, you know if you don't do it this way it's the wrong way well i mean in the end if it goes if, if it's made correctly and it ships in the package like i don't care if you put it in left-handed or right-handed correct that's great advice um what do you what do you i mean like now we're you know sure basically second half of the year at this point yeah. uh what are you really looking forward to for the rest of the year what do you I mean, I, I'm over, I'm over the R and D part. I mean, the, the thing I'm most excited about is moving. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, and nervous. We, we're in a very small, very old building. We're moving to really like our, we own the whole building. So it's super, super cool. You know, now we're looking at like, man, what are we going to put in a soda fountain in there instead of like, yeah. <laughs> do the, instead of like do the toilets work today kind of stuff. Um, but like we just launched a big, big new product for, for menopause for women. That should be huge looking into a bunch, like I'm on the R and D side. So I'm, you know, planning the, the fall and winter product launches because yes. when we, when we plan something, we have to get it, we have to make it, we have to test it. So we usually have a group of say a hundred people that use it. And, and then we, we've really run on before and afters. So we have a, if you go to our website, you'll see like all the people are, oh, this is how it used to be in the sodas now. And so that's really been our, our big thing. So like we have to have two months previous so that people can get there before and then they're after, and then we can start to market. And we just launched, you know, like I said, our estrogen boost, our menopause cream, which is um, really the biggest marketing opportunity for us. Cause when we're a medical provider, when we're, we're targeting dermatology, you usually have to market to a thing. Do you have a spot? Do you have a wrinkle? Do you have a thing? Um, this cream is for women. Yes. Biological women, all of them. Every single one is going to go through menopause. We can market to every single person, which makes it a huge market for us, something we haven't done before. So that's super exciting for me, right? We're kind of opening up this can of like, hey, now we just need to get this to people. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, as 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 the great Sean Carter would say, and I'm 
loosely modifying what he once said. <laughs> I wish you health. I wish you wealth. I wish you greater warehouse space. You're already you're already going on that last. Yeah, one. I'm going for it, man. Love it. <laughs> um, we've been lucky to 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 witness y'all's growth um, very much from a back seat, but it's 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 fabulous to hear you speak about it. Um, and, and share the learnings with the entire group. So thank you, Dan. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, that's super great. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, before we go here, Nima, why don't you tell people a little bit more about Shippo and, and when they should be working with you? Oh, thank you. Um, we're your global neighborhood friendly uh, parcel shipping infrastructure. Uh, we're fortunate enough to uh, partner with great folks like Dan at Muesli. Uh, we serve as a partner to to ship up your your previous uh, presenters, um, we serve as infrastructure for Goat, Etsy, Shopify, Wix. Uh, we're just white labeled on the back end for um, a, a big portion of um, the inner tubes. So um, that's that's really the bread and butter of our business. As we're growing, um, we are also launching a data platform. Given the the scale that we've been fortunate to reach. Uh, on our core business, the shipping API part. And again, we have, we're very, very lucky to be able to work with uh, over 100,000 direct businesses globally. Um, and through our partners, we actually serve probably a little over a million sellers globally um, of, of all sizes and kinds from the weekend warrior to a publicly traded company that, that fulfills through a warehouse. Awesome. Love it. Thank you both so much. Uh, really enjoyed this session. Unique challenges, Dan, and really exciting uh, plans and opportunities for the future. So thank you for joining us. And thank you, Nima, as well. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, guys. Bye, y'all. Thank you, Dan.